Thank you, John, and thank you all for coming out today. And again, it's an honor for me to be back at, at uh, Southern. Um, so grateful for what God has done here uh, these past 20 or 30 years. And, and uh, uh, obviously, we, we cheer you on from uh, Kansas City. Um, I want to talk uh, today about, about Jefferson, and I'm, I'm glad to see that uh, they distributed copies of the, the, my Jefferson biography, and, and I'm going to be drawing from, from that book in this, in this lecture. Um, if you were here yesterday, uh, you, you saw that Americans in 1776 were quick to seek divine approval of the revolution, um, not least in Thomas Jefferson's Declaration of Independence. But that didn't necessarily mean that those asking for God's blessing were Christians. Uh, many patriots were Christians, of course, uh, but several of the top tier founders were not Christians, at least not in a sense that the great tradition of, of Christian theology would recognize in terms of believing in the Trinity and, and the divinity of Christ and so forth. Uh, so in this lecture, I want to offer a kind of counter study to the first. Um, and one in which we consider Jefferson's late-in-life commitment to Unitarian theology and his composition of two versions of what we call the Jefferson Bible. The, the months before and after the 1803 Louisiana Purchase witnessed the most decisive season of religious reflection of Thomas Jefferson's life. He had regularly thought about religious and ethical matters since his time as a student at, at William and Mary, but he had never uh, formed a definite theological position. He had e eclectic strains of Epicurean and, and Republican, smaller Republican and, and Christian thought, but all that had not crystallized, I think, into a personal creed. The reasons why 1803 and 04 were, became so decisive for Jefferson it, it, are unclear. Why indeed does anyone go through a spiritual uh, or intellectual transformation at the specific time that they do? Many experience their most decisive changes in, in early adulthood. Uh, that was the case for me, certainly. I got saved as a college uh, freshman. But uh, that, that was also the case at, at, often at the time of the founding. Uh, Jefferson's fellow skeptic, uh, Ben Franklin, for instance, rejected his parents' uh, Calvinist faith and, as, as a teenager. Uh, but Jefferson's moment of religious commitment came much later in his life. By 1804, the 61-year-old concluded that Jesus' ethical teachings were the, quote, most benevolent and sublime ever known to humankind. They were superior to all others. And this was the basis upon which Jefferson concluded that he was a Christian, or a Christian rationally understood. Jefferson had gone through seasons of severe stress before, most obviously in the death of his wife in 1782 and the political crises of the 1790s. The furor of the 1790s had abated little in Jefferson's first term as president, and if anything, Criticisms against him in 1800 when he was elected became more bitter and more focused on his alleged atheism. He was not an atheist, but, but he was often called an atheist. In 1802, uh, Thomas Paine, who we also discussed yesterday, returned to America after a lengthy tenure in Europe, giving Federalist newspapers, anti-Jefferson newspapers, fresh opportunity to associate Jefferson with the most notorious anti-Christian writer among the Founding Fathers. Jefferson must have also been horrified by public allegations about his sexual relationship with Sally Hemings, one of his slaves. Those charges began to appear in newspapers in 1802. Uh, Jefferson would never address those charges in public. They may have made him anxious, however, to present himself as a supporter of Christian morality in the eyes of friends and in the eyes of his daughters, Martha Jr. and Mary. Jefferson's relationships with Benjamin Rush and Joseph Priestley uh, gave him essential resources to craft a rationalist, ethics-focused version of Christianity. By 1800, uh, Benjamin Rush, the Philadelphia physician and patriot leader, had planted the notion in Jefferson's mind 
that true Christianity was uniquely suited to republicanism. And then in 1803, Jefferson read the scientist and minister Joseph Priestley's Unitarian tract, Socrates and Jesus Compared. And this tract explained why Jesus' ethics possessed, quote, infinite superiority, as Priestley put it, to ancient pagan philosophy like that of Socrates. Priestley believed that Jesus' preternatural teaching authority originated in divine revelation. Those claims didn't interest Jefferson so much as Jesus' teachings themselves. As Priestley noted, Jesus' universal mandate to love, the, the agape ethic, represented a, quote, purer and more sublime morality respecting God and man than any heathen could have a just idea of. Meanwhile, President Jefferson wrote Priestley and told him that in light of Socrates and Jesus compared and his conversations with Benjamin Rush, he, Jefferson, had begun to outline his own, quote, view of the Christian system. Jefferson proposed to evaluate ancient pagan philosophers such as Epicurus uh, and the, quote, ethics of the Jews showing their strengths and weaknesses. This would allow him to project Jesus as the preeminent ethical teacher who inculcated the, quote, principles of a pure deism and juster notions of the attributes of God to reform their moral doctrines to the standard of reason, justice, and philanthropy. Uh, deism here, by the way, meant religion in its simplest form, especially belief in one God. Jefferson told another correspondent that, quote, Jesus embraced with charity and philanthropy our neighbors, our countrymen, and the whole family of mankind. Unlike Priestley, Jefferson said, quote, that he would purposely omit the question of his divinity, Jesus' divinity, and even of his inspiration. He would purposely omit those questions. Jefferson noted that the biblical records of Jesus' life, he thought, were imperfect and incomplete because they were recalled by flawed men long after they heard Jesus teach. Quote, yet such are the fragments remaining as to show a master workman, the president surmised. The gospel still captured the moral brilliance of Jesus' teaching. So during the extraordinary month of April 1803, Jefferson was sufficiently motivated to write down a, quote, syllabus of an estimate of the merit of the doctrines of Jesus compared with those of others. He showed the syllabus to Benjamin Rush and others whose opinion he valued, reminding Rush of de delightful personal conversations they had had in the late 1790s about Christianity he assured the doctor that the views expressed in the syllabus were, quote, very different from that anti-Christian system imputed to me by those who know nothing of my opinions. Jefferson then offered the most succinct statement of faith that he ever made. Quote, I am a Christian in the only sense in which he, Jesus, wished anyone to be sincerely attached to his doctrines in preference to all others, ascribing to himself every human excellence and believing he never claimed any other. So Jefferson had concluded that he was a rationalist and ethical Christian, opposing the, quote, corruptions of Christianity imposed by the priests of Jesus he embraced, quote, the genuine precepts of Jesus himself. Jefferson told Rush that when he read Socrates and Jesus compared on a short vacation to Monticello, his Charlottesville mansion, uh, it afforded him an opportunity to gather his views in the syllabus. Again, he asked Rush to keep the syllabus private, hoping that it would not be, quote, exposed to the malignant perversions of those who make every word from me a text for new misrepresentations and calumnies. Jefferson wanted confidants to know that he had become a naturalistic Christian, but he did not want this change reported in the newspapers. 
Jefferson sent the syllabus to Priestley, Rush, his daughters, and others. And it began by offering, considering great ancient philosophers, including Socrates, Epicurus, and Seneca. He admitted that he still admired their teachings on the passions and tranquility, but they focused too much on the interior life. Quote, in developing our duties to others, they were short and defective. Still less have they inculcated peace, charity, and love to our fellow men, or embraced with benevolence the whole family of mankind. Jews advanced a true idea of one God, but their ideas about that God were, quote, degrading and injurious. Jesus entered this milieu as a great reformer. Jesus operated under manifest disadvantages, including his Jewish context, his lack of education, and the fact that he passed on his teachings, Jefferson said, to, quote, the most unlettered and ignorant of men. Uh, <clears throat> one of Jefferson's correspondents suggested that he moderate his characterization of the gospel writers and call them, quote, men of but little literary information. <laughs> anyway, Jefferson <laughs> saw Jesus' teachings as, quote, again, the most perfect and sublime that has ever been taught. The records we have of those teachings, he emphasized, are, quote, defective and underdeveloped. Jesus only had three years to develop his philosophy before his tragic death. He did not record his teachings personally. And, quote, fragments only of what he did deliver have come to us, mutilated, misstated, and often unintelligible. The gospel accounts, Jefferson wrote, quote, have been still more disfigured by the corruptions of schismatizing followers who altered the simple purity of Jesus' philosophy for other ends. Jefferson later exclaimed that money-grubbing priests had adulterated Jesus' teachings, quote, by artificial constructions into a mere contrivance to filch wealth and power to themselves. Those corruptors, he said, were the real antichrist. Jefferson explained that, quote, the question of his Jesus' Jesus's being a member of the Godhead or in direct communication with it, claimed for him by some of his followers and denied by others, is foreign to the present view. He knew that he and Priestley did not agree about Jesus' divine mission. And Jefferson told Priestley, the Unitarian minister, as much when he sent him the syllabus. Jefferson's interest in Jesus was merely ethical. It was in Jesus' quote, universal philanthropy to all mankind that he found the quote, peculiar superiority of the system of Jesus. He did concede that a quote, future state was essential to Jesus' teachings as a chief incentive to moral behavior. He had hoped that Priestley would do more to assess Jesus' teachings in their ancient context and to produce an edited version of the Gospels with only Jesus' authentic precepts included. But Priestley died in February 1804, depriving Jefferson of his most influential religious conversation partner. Jefferson's fascination with Jesus led him to produce the first version of the Jefferson Bible. He reckoned that he could mine the Gospels for the allegedly real teachings of Jesus. Now, biblical scholars, many of you know, have fought many wars since Jefferson's time about the reliability of the Gospels. But Jefferson was confident that distinguishing Jesus' true words in the New Testament was like picking out, quote, diamonds in a dunghill. Jesus' real teachings are the diamonds, the rest is the dunghill. Sometime during February and March 1804, Jefferson cut and pasted his compilation of the Gospels, only in English, onto blank sheets and had them bound into a volume. He recalled later that he did the work in, quote, one or two evenings only while I lived at Washington, overwhelmed with other business. This man is the President of the United States. Uh, he has other things to do. So anyway, he's working on this at night. 
uh, in his spare time. So any, anyway, the, the, the text of the first Jefferson Bible, unfortunately, is lost. Uh, but he titled it, we have the title, quote, The Philosophy of Jesus of Nazareth, being an abridgment of the New Testament for the use of the Indians. And that bit about the Indians has been perplexing to historians. Given his interest in Indian missions, languages, and education, Jefferson might have hoped that the volume would introduce some Native Americans to authentic, as he saw it, rationalist Christianity. Some scholars, however, have posited that, quote, Indians was code for his Federalist enemies, who, who said that he was an atheist. In any case, he told John Adams later that he made the philosophy of Jesus for his, quote, own use, and that he regarded the 46-page volume as a distillation of Jesus's, quote, pure and unsophisticated doctrines, such as were professed and acted on by the unlettered apostles, the apostolic fathers, and the Christians of the first century. It was an attempt, he thought, at recovering true Christian teaching. Years later, Jefferson still told correspondents about the, quote, we little book, he pasted together in 1804. It is a paradigma of his doctrines made by cutting the text out of the book and arranging them on the pages of a blank book, a more beautiful or precious morsel of ethics I have never seen. And he presented the the philosophy of Jesus as, quote, proof that I am a real Christian, underlined. That is to say, a disciple of the doctrines of Jesus, very different from the Platonists, who call me infidel. Platonists are the people who believe in the Trinity. Uh, This morsel of ethics, along with the syllabus, encapsulated Jefferson's beliefs. With the gospel compilation complete, his religious pilgrimage had arrived at its destination. And in retirement, he would flesh out his beliefs with correspondents, including John Adams, who became his most engaging conversation partner on religion after Rush and Priestley. Aided by this uh, small letter-writing community, Jefferson had settled upon an intellectually uh, satisfying version of Christianity. Uh, In retirement, Jefferson's longest standing interlocutor on religion was John Adams, and we we have a a wonderful collection of the correspondence between Adams and Jefferson and and their retirement. It's it's absolutely fascinating, and and much of it is riveting. Uh, Their their theological discussions could be quite technical, though, covering subjects that may seem arcane and esoteric today. Uh, Jefferson and Adams' friendship had happily resumed in retirement following years of estrangement after the bitter 1800 presidential election in which Jefferson defeated the sitting president, John Adams. When Adams and Jefferson started corresponding again, one of the first topics that they discussed was prophecy. Prophecy. Adams told him that, quote, although you and I are weary of politics, you may be surprised to find me making a transition to such a subject as prophecies. It was odd for two Unitarians to talk about prophecy, but a lot of Unitarians believed in prophecy. And it was 1812 uh, when they were writing this, a year of turmoil as the U.S. faced new war with Britain. Uh, Prophetic writings proliferated in Britain and America and the post-revolutionary era and interest in the last days surged in 1811 and 12 due to a series of earthquakes and fires, uh, astronomical phenomena, and obviously war. Uh, Among the most popular works was the English Unitarian Joseph Tower's Illustrations of Prophecy. And Adams knew of Tower's, quote, ponderous volumes, which Tower's had written, quote, to prove that the French Revolution was the commencement of the millennium, Adams noted. Uh, Adams was incredulous about this this belief, and and he sketched a comparative view of prophets across races and religion. Now, just think about This is what Adams and Jefferson are talking about in their retirement, like his comparative views of prophecy. Okay, it's a a lost world. Um, uh, and, And so... Adams said, let's talk about how prophecy works across different religions and people of different ethnicities. 
Virginia had recently seen the publication of prophetic volumes by two authors named Nimrod Hughes and Christopher McPherson. Uh, you get a gold star if you've heard of either one of them, uh, whom Adams had heard were both, quote, mulattoes. Uh, Hughes was actually white. Uh, McPherson was indeed a person of mixed race. And Adams wondered if, quote, two such mulattoes might raise the devil among the Negroes in that vicinity, in other words, slave rebellion, uh, for though they are evidently cracked, in other words, they're, they're insane, they are not much more irrational than Dr. Towers, who talked about the millennium and, and the French Revolution. Prophets, therefore, might be entirely deluded, he thought, but that did not necessarily make them unpersuasive writers. Even the revered Joseph Priestley had believed in prophecy, Adams reminded Jefferson, kind of poking fun at Jefferson's fondness for Priestley. Comparative religion has always been a favorite topic for critics of traditional uh, Christian belief. Christianity's authority depends on its unique truth claims. If it was just one of many religions whose prophets all made similar assertions, Christianity, in this perspective, might become more of a comparative object of study than a source of unique divine knowledge. Thus, Adams opened his long list of contemporary prophets with the supposed mulatto prophets of Virginia and ended by citing the, quote, prophet of the Wabash. This was the Shawnee visionary Tenskwatawa, who was the brother of the better known Tecumseh. Tenskwatawa, sometimes called the prophet, had reportedly received a series of visions beginning in 1805. His teachings made him one of the most influential Indian leaders in the Ohio and Indiana regions. In 1811, Tenskwatawa's base at Prophetstown, Indiana, was destroyed by American forces under the future president, William Henry Harrison. Adams thought that Tenskwatawa's example demonstrated that white de devotees of prophecy were just as superstitious as Indians were. And he concluded that, quote, whenever any great turmoil happens in the world, it has produced fresh prophets. Their verifiable prognostications, however, were invariably refuted by the passage of time. Adams thought that Jefferson might know more about the Virginia prophets or about Tenskwatawa since the prophet had risen to prominence during Jefferson's presidential administration. Jefferson said that he had never heard of Nimrod Hughes, but he had actually known Christopher McPherson for decades. The literate McPherson had re received freedom from slavery in 1792. In 1799, McPherson received a shattering vision, he said, in which Jesus removed his heart, took it to heaven, washed it, and then gave it back to McPherson. And this experience, he said, confirmed his prophetic vocation. Despite McPherson's ecstatic experience, uh, he otherwise led a fairly mundane life uh, and managed to secure government secretarial jobs in both Philadelphia and Richmond. In these capacities, Jefferson came to know and actually to like McPherson, even though he regarded him as, quote, crazy, foggy, his head always in the clouds. <laughs> so Jefferson gave him occasional paid errands to do and legal assistance out of pity for uh, McPherson's vulnerable situation. Jefferson whimsically reminded Adams, however, and th this is such a fascinating exchange between Adams and Jefferson. Jefferson reminded Adams of Jeremiah 29's injunction that, quote, every man that is mad or insane and maketh himself a prophet, thou shouldest put him in prison and in the stocks. Anybody have that verse memorized? Uh, and Adams was shocked by that obscure reference coming from Jefferson since Adams assumed that he knew the text of the Bible better than Jefferson did. But Jefferson had not cited chapter and verse in this verse about prophets, uh, so Adams had to literally pull out his concordance to find where that verse was located in the Bible. Uh, it's, it's absolutely extraordinary how well the skeptic Jefferson knew his Bible. Anyway, uh, to, so let's fast forward to uh, the late 18 teens when Jefferson produced a second compilation of the Gospels, which he called The Life and Morals of Jesus of Nazareth. And because this text has survived, this is usually what people mean when they speak of the Jefferson Bible. 
Just remember, there were two versions of it, but this is the text that survived. Uh, this Jefferson Bible was only known to a small circle of Jefferson's friends during his lifetime. Heeding their frequent warnings, Jefferson never did publish the life and morals of Jesus of Nazareth. Jefferson told a disappointed Matthew Carey, an enter enterprising Philadelphia publisher, that if he made life and morals public, quote, I should only add a unit to the number of bed bedlamites. Uh, Bedlam was a notorious mental hospital in London. It would drive people crazy if I published this thing. Uh, so Jefferson saved the book, he said, for private use and discussions with friends. Today, the cut and paste compilation has taken on a level of exposure that Jefferson would never have expected. Uh, the Smithsonian acquired it from a Jefferson descendant in 1895, and the U.S. government pr published a facsimile of it in 1904. So that's the first time it was actually published. And then in 2011, the National Museum of American History restored the original volume, which obviously was very fragile, and it allowed for the creation of a, of a new, beautifully crafted facsimile. And if you care anything about these, these things, this is one of the favorite books that I have on my shelf because it's actually you know, created to look exactly like the, uh, the Jefferson uh, Bible. It's, a, it's just a lovely uh, facsimile of the book. We don't know as much about when Jefferson, when Jefferson created life and morals as we do about f the philosophy of Jesus, but we obviously know much more about the text itself because it survived and the earlier compilation did not. In life and morals, Jefferson literally, literally cut out gospel passages, this time not just from English versions, but from Greek, Latin, French, and English editions of the New Testament. And he pasted these excerpts in parallel columns in a blank book that he had gotten for the project. And he had it bound with an expensive red leather cover. Thus, it was not so much that Jefferson cut out the supernatural elements of the Gospels, but that he left those elements behind in gutted editions. So, you know, you can imagine his floor desk covered with cut up copies of the, of the New Testament. This Jefferson Bible included more content than the philosophy did, focusing on Jesus' life as well as his teachings. Scholars routinely note that Jefferson removed miraculous content from the Gospels, and this was true in, in many cases. As historian Peter Manso at the Smithsonian notes, uh, Jefferson's approach has the curious effect of presenting the Gospel accounts of Jesus with, quote, all set up and no payoff. Uh, no payoff meaning no resurrection. Uh, in fact, the last verse that he included in the Jefferson Bible was from Matthew 27, where the disciples, quote, rolled a great stone to the door of the sepulcher and departed. That's the last phrase in the book. There is no resurrection or ascension to heaven. It's quite startling, actually, to, to look at how that, that ends with Jesus' grave that's not empty. It is easy to overstate how naturalistic Jefferson's act extracts were, however. The 84-page book includes passages dealing with the last days, the coming great tri tribulation for God's people, uh, a fiery hell, future resurrection of humankind, and the second coming of the Son of Man. Uh, Jefferson's Jesus also has special foreknowledge of future events. Why Jefferson included this supernatural material in his compilation is not clear. Uh, maybe he found those parts plausible. Perhaps he found it difficult to adhere uh, to st strict naturalism, since, as you know, the Gospels weave in many supernatural happenings along with Jesus' ethical teachings. Sometimes it's hard to completely cut them apart. Or maybe Jefferson just didn't think about the choices as much as we might expect. But the opening page of clippings uh, illustrates Jefferson's approach. He started with Luke chapter 2, the narrative of Jesus' birth in Bethlehem. He skipped the angel Gabriel's announcement to the Virgin Mary that Jesus would be miraculously conceived by the Holy Spirit. Uh, he also excised Luke 2, 8 through 20 regarding the angel's appearance to the shepherds. Uh, and so we don't get them saying glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill to men. But Jefferson didn't cut out all references to angels. For example, he included Jesus' teaching in Matthew 13 that, quote, the Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend 
and them which do iniquity, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire, and there shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Uh, presumably he included this passage because it was part of Jesus' explanation of a parable. Um, Jefferson tended to include parables rather than cut them out, even if they contained material he might consider objectionable or unreliable. But he steered away from narratives in which supernatural beings like angels were part of the action. The parables, the Sermon on the Mount, and similar passages were key because they demonstrated, Jefferson believed, the kind of moral behavior God required for salvation. In contrast to the classic Protestant belief in salvation by grace alone, Jefferson believed that God would save people who behaved morally. This belief made Jefferson especially critical of the French reformer John Calvin. Jefferson started making disparaging comments about John Calvin before he composed the life and morals, apparently because of tracts he read about theological debates between Unitarians and traditional Congregationalists in New England. And so increasingly, Jefferson simply defined his religious views as anti-Calvinism. For example, he wrote about Calvinism to New Hampshire Congressman Salma Hale, who visited Monticello in 1818 and discussed theology with Jefferson and subsequently sent Jefferson pamphlets on the, on the Unitarian controversy. Jefferson told Hale that, quote, Calvinism has introduced into the Christian religion more new absurdities than its leader, Jesus, had purged it of old ones. Our Savior did not come into the world to save metaphysicians only. His doctrines are leveled to the simplest understanding, and it is only by banishing mysteries and subtleties which they have nicknamed Christianity and getting back to the plain and unsophisticated precepts of Christ that we become real Christians. The followers of Calvin were not real Christians, or at least their faith was corrupt. He even told John Adams that Calvin, Calvin was an atheist and that his religion was demonism. Think he doesn't like Calvin? Uh, here Jefferson turned tables on evangelical Christians who conventionally asserted that nominal Christians were not real believers. And the next year, Jefferson wrote that he considered his religion to be, quote, the reverse of Calvin's, that we are saved by our good works, which are within our power, and not by our faith, which is not within our power. Which I have to say that's a good line. I'm a Calvinist, but that's a good line. Uh, and so it, finally, he, he told Pastor Ezra Stiles, Eli of Philadelphia, that, quote, you are a Calvinist. I am not. I am a sect by myself, as far as I know. Great stuff. Uh, Jefferson regarded himself as a sect by himself because he didn't even agree with all of Jesus' teachings, he said, uh, even when reconstructed in their purity. He wrote to his longtime friend William Short in 1820, around when Jefferson was finishing the life and morals. Jefferson said that he hoped to separate, quote, the gold from the dross in the Gospels, Restore to Jesus the former and leave the latter to the stupidity of some and roguery of others. Composing the gospel extracts also gave Jefferson a fresh opportunity to assess what he accepted in Jesus' authentic teachings and what he did not. Jefferson assumed there must be some content in the gospels that represented Jesus' actual philosophy. It was not all invented later by others. Sending William Short a copy of his syllabus of an estimate of the merit of the doctrines of Jesus that he had written in 1803, he told Short that, quote, it is not to be understood that I am with him, Jesus, in all his doctrines. G Jefferson considered himself to be a materialist, and he assumed that Jesus was a spiritualist. In other words, Jesus believed that there was, in fact, a non-material realm of spirit, and, and Jefferson didn't believe that. Within months of explaining that contrast to Short, however, Jefferson speculated that maybe even Jesus was a materialist, <laughs> which is ludicrous, but that's what he said. Uh, Sir, sure, he told John Adams, Jesus had said that God was a spirit in John 4, a verse that he included in Life and Morals, but Jesus didn't say that spirit wasn't material. This is silly, but that's what Jefferson said. Anyway, um, 
Jefferson also noted that J Jesus preached repentance for the forgiveness of sins, while Jefferson fo focused on good works as a, quote, counterpoise to sins. Still, he regarded Jesus' distillation of the greatest commandments, quote, the sum of all religion. As taught by, quote, its best preacher, those commandments were to, quote, fear God and love thy neighbor. Such teachings involved, quote, no mystery. They need no explanation. As for Jesus' divinity, uh, Jefferson told Short that he was convinced that, quote, Jesus did not mean to impose himself on mankind as the Son of God, physically speaking. Any equivalence to, of Jesus with God, he said, was nonsense. But that Jesus, quote, might conscientiously believe himself inspired from above is very possible, he conceded. Unitarians such as Priestley generally believed that Jesus did consider himself inspired by God. They rejected Trinitarianism, but they believed that Jesus was operating under divine sanction. That's what people like Priestley believed. But Jefferson wasn't so sure. Jesus, quote, might readily mistake the, mistake the coruscations or flashes of his own fine genius for inspirations of a higher order. How many of our wisest men still believe in the reality of these inspirations while perfectly sane on all other subjects? Uh, so, so what he was saying is that the Unitarians' belief that Jesus was divinely inspired was forgivable, but still nearly insane. In any case, Jefferson considered himself, quote, authorized, authorized to conclude the purity and distinction of Jesus' character in opposition to the impostures which the New Testament authors would fix upon him. So in this confident sense of authority over the text, I think that Jefferson illustrated a vast gulf, a vast gulf between those who believe in the Bible's entire God-inspired veracity and those who see themselves as subjecting the Bible to the withering glare of contemporary academic and elite cultural discourse. The former seek, I think, to have a divinely inspired, inerrant word of God sit in judgment of the reader. The latter seek to sit in judgment of an allegedly man-constructed, uh, time-bound Bible by the standards of human rationality and contemporary ethical mores. Thank you very much.